Hey Brick Maniacs, welcome to the Designer Studio episode for the Apollo 11 Command Module. Um, this one is a joint design between uh, Austin and Amanda, so we'll have both of them on this episode uh, to talk about this build. Austin kind of has the history behind this pretty well down, so I think we want to start with that. Um, and then we'll dive into some of the components of this build and uh, just take it from there. All right, so this is the Apollo 11 Command Module. Um, and you see it in the two different configurations that the kit comes with here. So the primary build here is this with the orange ring and the white balloons. This is the, the very end of the mission, um, right as they were being rescued by the, uh, the divers and the Sea King. Um, so it would be right above here, right? Exactly. This is right about exactly. the area where you want to picture your Sea King now available online. <laughs> so if you want to build a really cool mock, exactly. get some blue bricks down here, Sea King up there. That would be a massive space mock. It really would. At 135th, would. Be, that, that would so be cool. very impressive. Anyways, keep going. Um, if you do not want to display it in the ocean, we do have this alternate build, which is the sort of quote-unquote in-space build, um, which this has the completed cone, it has the docking adapter here. Um, so a little bit of explanation as to what exactly it is that you're seeing here. So uh, you might be familiar with seeing the Apollo spacecraft as you'd have the cone sort of as the front quote unquote of the whole spaceship. You'd have the tube back here and then the engine in the back. So that tube is called the service module. The cone is called the command module. The command module is the only spot where the astronauts would actually live in until they docked with the, the lunar module that stuck out on the front here. But uh, the entire tube in the back, that would have carried their fuel, their water, their fuel cells, um, the, you know, the engine on the back for propulsion and all that. So we, when we were designing this kit, we figured we were just going to do the cone simply because the, the doing the entire uh, service module and the it's engine would have, yeah, yeah, that would have been, they made the kit three times as much. So, so comparatively to Gemini, how roomy is this capsule? Uh, honestly, to the astronauts at the time, this was a luxury liner. Okay, um, that's what I was curious about. It looks, it looks cramped. I mean, I can, I can open the door here. Mm -hmm. You can, I don't know if you can see inside there with the camera. Um, otherwise, you've got an action shot render we can throw up on screen too that shows the inside. It looks fairly cramped, but here's the thing that was so unique about this capsule: the seats would fold away. So after they were in space, in orbit, they're not being pulled down by gravity anymore. Uh, they would fold the seats all the way oh, into a stowage position. Oh, just literally away. And like it was, not. yeah, and, and it was actually kind of a big sort of roomy building inside there. Um, and they had, uh, they, the seats sort of turned into little cots that were, were against one of the walls. They could strap themselves in it so they could sleep. Uh, and then when you add sort of the extra room, the, the bulk of the lunar module that it would dock to up here, uh, they, you know, they had two different rooms that they could, right, they could be move. in. They, mm -hmm. It actually, uh, it had a fairly substantial amount of living space once it was all uh, on its way to the moon and docked and seats were folded away and all that. I'm glad to know they were more comfortable because it just seemed awful in the early stages. <laughs> oh yeah, absolutely. So, you know, spending uh, spending two weeks as some of the, the mission durations mm. were uh, in, in these vehicles was a, a, a huge upgrade compared yeah. to what it had been. And, you know, then we got stuff like the space shuttle and space stations and it, it got upgraded from there. But mm -hmm. for its time, this was this was really spacious. So this in-space build of the command module, the key difference between this and the landing build, apart from the obvious, the, the flotation ring, the three balloons here, um, the cone actually is complete all the way to the top, and the little steering wheel here represents the docking adapter. Uh, as it was landing, going through re-entry, it would shed the top part of the cone. That was the cover for the parachutes. So the parachutes would be ejected out, uh, and then when it landed in the water, these balloons would inflate, which would, in case it landed upside down, it would tip it back upright. Okay. Uh, so the astronauts wouldn't be hanging upside down until they got rescued. Yeah, that would not be a lot of fun, especially if the seas were rough. Um, otherwise, the capsules look basically the same. Um, so you've got the door here, and you've got some, uh, some really awesome UV printing by SLAM. You've got these, uh, the little porthole on the door. You've got windows on that the window sides. That window printing is really impressive, too. And then, yeah, you've got the, uh, the sort of uh, front-facing mm -hmm. windows, as it were, for the, uh, uh, the pilot and the commander there. Um, and th those are printed on the transparent flags with the sort of masked cutout for the shape of the window there, which turned out really, really cool. Um, you've got these little texture printed bumps along the sides here and along the door. Uh, these are actually exhaust ports um, for various, uh, various waste products that the capsule would generate. So this, this was actually an oxygen exhaust port. Um, as the capsule uh, ascended on the rocket, it would vent its oxygen down to a lower pressure. Um, this one is a water, a, a wastewater exhaust port, uh, condensation, etc. And then this one is a urine exhaust port. 
Uh, if you've seen Apollo 13, um, they vent their urine out in one of the scenes. They call it the constellation Urine, and you can see it's coming out of that port right there in the movie. <laughs> Um, otherwise, all of these little black dots and little black ovals here, uh, those are the reaction control thrusters. That's how the spacecraft would steer in space. The so little jets of gas would shoot out of it and it would give full pitch roll and yaw control to it. Pretty much impossible to dock otherwise, right? Right, yeah. yes. Uh, around the back, we have, uh, this is the umbilical connection. So I mentioned earlier there would have been the big service module that had all their fuel, water, electricity. Um, that, that all of those went through this port right here. And in real life, there were probably a hundred different wires and hoses that were going in a big bundle through that port. Uh, when it came time to re-enter, this right here is the only thing that would actually re-enter safely. The, the service module would burn up in the atmosphere. There was a, a little guillotine blade that would slice down and cut all of those wires all at once, right at the last moment. And then this thing would just survive on its batteries for the last few minutes of the flight. Wow. Uh, so then it, it, uh, it lands, it jettisons the top of its cone, starts looking like this. It, uh, it parachutes down, splashes down in the sea. These balloons inflate to make sure it stays upright. And then the Sea King and the divers show up. This ring is not actually a part of the capsule. The divers brought this mm -hmm. ring with them. Attached and they it. would attach this to it. So the reason for the flotation ring, when the capsule can actually float on its own, is because once the door opens, if there are rough seas and a wave happens to go inside the capsule, it could potentially sink. It could be so expensive. they needed to attach this ring before the door was able to open. So they would attach this ring, they would provide a little life draft, and then the divers would actually get out of there because they were worried about contamination from potential moon viruses or space madness or whatever. You know, it was wow. the 60s, they didn't quite have space all this stuff figured out. Space madness, far out, dude. Um, so the, uh, the astronauts would actually put on their protective uh, environmental hazard suits and mm -hmm. they, would, they would exit into the raft and they get pulled up into the helicopter. Uh, and they had to spend two weeks living in an RV after that uh, as the, that was the sort of containment vessel to make sure that they weren't going to uh, you know, sprout tentacles or extra eyes or whatever mm -hmm. they were worried about. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I want to show you, going a little bit more over the thinking, I want to show you the inside of this capsule. Mm -hmm. um, so it'll take a little bit of building to, to open it up, but Slam got some really cool UV printed details in there. Yeah, let's break um, it down. Yeah. So I'm going to remove some of these side panels here. We'll open up the door. So cool to see those minifigs integrated like that. Such a yeah, tight space. Yeah, yeah they, you, you build the minifigs in, but there is room for all three of them. They're all sitting as they should mm -hmm. in there. Um, and in front of, uh, in front of, uh, Neil Armstrong there is actually the, the, the instrument panel mm -hmm. for the capsule. So Slam loves sort of his instrument panels. Yes, he does. Um, so the top here kind of pivots up, and I'll remove the windows. There is Slam's super awesome UV printed instrument panel. Um, a lot of this will look familiar to you if you've seen Apollo 13 or Apollo 11 um, or uh, First Man, any of those movies. Um, you've got sort of the artificial horizon gimbal there. Uh, you've got the, uh, the CO2 and oxygen levels. Um, one of the coolest details, there's uh, the actual mission clock. It's this green uh, sort of uh, digital clock looking display. And this mission clock would have been running from the very moment the engines lit yep. until the moment they got rescued. And cool. the time that is shown on here is actually the point in the mission when the divers would have attached the orange collar. So you know, if you have it set up where they're doing a sea rescue mock, you've got the Sea King up there, you know that the time on the mission clock mm -hmm. inside the capsule is accurate. See, look at what they're doing for you. They're just laying everything out. All you need to do is put the pieces together. So now that, uh, that this has been opened up, we can actually remove the minifigures here. And Amanda's going to come in and talk about them and mm -hmm. some, of the, some of the build techniques here in a little bit. But um, what you can actually see is there's also UV printed seat details there. <laughs> so we actually have the, uh, the harnesses and the straps. Um, there were sort of these, uh, these canvas like cots stretched across metal frames. They didn't look particularly comfortable, but, uh, but yeah, those are the seats. Definitely a lot to dive into. You know, some of you may question the, uh, the reasoning behind detailed printed items that are inside a build like that, but let me tell you, once you've put a build together that has those detailed components in there, it makes the building process so much more fun. That's why you do it. Because it's yeah, really, it really, really cool to watch it come together with those parts. And who wants to put a sticker, you know, buried way inside their build. 
Well, yeah, that's that's about it for the uh, the the detail about the vehicle Sweet. itself. Um, yeah, Amanda did an awesome job on these minifigs, but uh, you know, she'll talk about them better than I can. Um, so yeah. Cool, we'll make that switch, but thank you very much, Austin, for joining us. Thank you. All right, so moving on, I have Amanda joining me. You might find her on Instagram as uh, MN Art Girl uh, to talk a little bit more about the composition of this build uh, and then also the minifigures because you designed them. Um, first things first, though, you guys have always had to build in kind of this, like, these funky shapes because of Space Race <laughs> and what it is. True story. What were you able to transfer from those earlier builds to this one that kind of maybe made that process a little easier? Or was it something where you're like, nope, I got nothing, we got to start from scratch? Um, honestly, the other ones we've done were smaller, and mm -hmm. there's always a couple things. I mean, we've gotten very clever with hinges um, <laughs> and things that maybe... We've tried a lot of things that weren't hinges that we made into hinges. Mm -hmm. um, kind of went back and forth on a lot of that kind of stuff. Um, but I think, on the whole, this one was this one was a, a, a it was a challenge. It yeah, was fun. Absolutely. It was it was interesting to try to try to get that shape without uh, you know driving each other nuts. It was good. <laughs> did you start at any one end, or did you bring the panels together first? Like what was um, step one? Yeah, yeah. We actually ended up starting at the bottom. Yeah. Okay. Um, and working our way out because we that you know. This circumference was such a like vital part of the yeah. entire thing, obviously. You get that right in the scale, yep. scale from there, you can kind of just worry about the height. Yeah, and Austin and I kind of went two different approaches, and I started on one, I was like, nah, this sucks. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> not gonna, we're not going this way. And so uh, we went with the kind of very classic fluted um, underside. Mm -hmm. um, worked out well. You yeah. know, it, uh, it's, it's Lego, there's only... You gotta you gotta work with what you got. That's my favorite part about working with Lego. Yeah, uh, I I was not a Lego kid, at all, and taught for a while. And the kids were like, "Come play Lego." I'm like, "No." <laughs> and uh, you know, I've been an artist my entire life, and and that's probably the thing that drew drew me into Lego is the fact that it had very strict pieces. You know, mm -hmm. unless you're horrible, you don't cut them. Uh, <laughs> flex please tube doesn't count. Please don't cut them. Yeah, flex tube doesn't count. Um, but yeah, no. So that was that was interesting starting that way, and then um, building up the plant panels and and trying to figure out you know how do you make something flat look round. Mm -hmm. were, were the blueprints what you guys used mostly to like dis determine which size panels to use to get that that shape, or was it kind of just like we know we don't want too many gaps, so we've got to make some panels different sizes? It, it was a lot about the gaps. Yeah. Okay. Um, obviously, the height and like the angle mm -hmm. um, determined some of it, and it's basically like you know the wider the panel. The more edges you have coming over the bottom end of that mm -hmm. uh, cone, um, and so it was kind of just a lot of playing around, um, a lot of different like I mean the desk we have a table that sits between our desks, and that was just covered in <laughs> pieces and different Version like one two nineteen. Do you remember this one time that you did this one thing and mm -hmm. can you find that piece? Yeah, so yeah, so um, I think it came together really well. It, it's on the whole, um, you know, I think the shape works really really well. Um, considering the scale and that Lego doesn't like doing round things that big. Yeah, so right. I'm quite pleased with it. Um, had the very classic built uh, Lego balls on there. Yeah, I think that looks awesome. <laughs> I mean, old school. That is mm -hmm. like old school building right mm -hmm. there. Uh, got to adjust those a little bit so they actually connect to the capsule. Um, but yeah, no. Um, got the inside, got the door working. Turned out really well. Yeah, absolutely. I think, uh, I think it definitely is is something that it, you know any space fan would would like to have on their desk. Mm -hmm. Well, and especially well. if you've been following the collection that you guys have been yeah, putting especially. together. Yeah, Abs especially. Absolutely. One well, of the, one of these days we have to have Austin's just like back panel on a TikTok or something. Oh yeah, no kidding. That uh, it's it's a pretty <laughs> impressive collection. A TikTok, mixture of, we got of, it. of us and and Lego. Uh, but anyways, moving on to the minifigures, yeah, mini also a cool cool addition. Um, yeah, so I was I was excited. I've been doing minis for a while now, obviously, but. Um, you know, they were like, oh, let's do them. And, and I was going to do the faces originally. And uh, we were going to have them in their full um, spacesuits, the white ones. Mm -hmm. have, we already have that art. I'm going to do a little adjustments, but on the whole, it was going to be the same. Um, I started doing some research on the faces and I went, they are not in their spacesuits in this capsule. So, um, oh, sure, yeah. Yeah, so I, I did some more research and uh, they're, they're kind of just in their. Um, day-to-day -day flight suits. Mm -hmm. um, that's not the right name. I'm trying to remember what the name was now. Anyway. Um, space jammies? Space jammies, uh, pretty much. I mean, they're just a giant uh, one onesie. Somebody in the wearing. comments section is just losing their mind right now, but that's 100%, okay. <laughs> 100%, 100%. Um, yeah, and uh, so I had a lot of fun trying to figure out, you know, how to do, I mean, there's tons of pockets, pockets mm -hmm. everywhere. Had a couple of 
uh, interesting times trying to figure out how to get all the zippers in there. Uh, yeah. A lot of zippers. Um, obviously, they want to be able to access things they need to access, I suppose. And not have them float away. Uh, yep, yep. Um, you know, and so yeah, a lot of, a lot of interesting paneling happening. Um, I, uh, I borrowed and kind of updated a little bit uh, Landon's kicks there because I was having a lot of trouble finding out what, um, what shoes were needed for these guys because, you know, pictures, they only showed the faces. Yeah, right. Um, and finally, when they're inside the um, RV after they've landed when they're on quarantine, um, I was able to zoom in and be like, wait, I swear, those are just the uh, Converse. Chuck Taylors. Nice. Yeah, Chuck Taylors. There you go. Thank you. Fix that. Um, I don't know shoes. That's cool. Um, but yeah, so that's what those were. And um, did the faces up. I, I had a lot of fun with those. Mm -hmm. um, you know, kind of goes from the, the Collins who's like, I don't get to go in space. I'm bummed. And, and Buzz, who's sitting there going, I'm cool. And, and then Neil, who's like, I'm in space. Um, yeah. Quite the iconic trio, to say the least. Yeah, so mm -hmm. I, was, I was pretty psyched to be able to do them. Um, biggest thing is, this guy's hair color is changing. Yeah, um, note to that, you'll see on the website note. that that hair piece is actually dark brown now. It is mm -hmm. dark brown. Light brown came on one fig. And um, I, when I was looking at parts, I was like, this guy's got a ton of them. Perfect. Um, didn't have enough. Uh, <laughs> and we couldn't get them. So we tried. So be it. Yep, so be it. It works. The only reason we changed it to reddish brown was just to have a little variety. They all had less hair than this, in truth, anyway. <laughs> um, sorry, guys. Sorry, Neil. You're not alive anymore, but you know what I mean. Um, Bazinga. Yeah, no. It, yeah, sorry. <laughs> um, but Leo doesn't have a lot of bald ish. Yeah, that's hair. true. Can't <laughs> yeah, have, can't have the stud cuts. hole showing. Right? And that Ben Franklin one might have been a little bit too much. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't have a lot of hair. Anyway. But yeah, so uh, that's, that's the figs. I think they came together nicely. Very, very cool. Well, there you have it. That is the Designer Studio episode for the Apollo 11 Command Module. Uh, make sure to check it out on BrickMania.com. Otherwise, thank you very much for watching.